Hello, good evening and a very warm welcome. It's uh, fabulous to see a full house. Uh, we are delighted to bring this event uh, in partnership with HarperCollins Publishers India. Uh, an evening with the celebrated author Amitav Ghosh uh, for the launch and a conversation about his exciting new book, Smoke and Ashes, Opium's Hidden Histories. Amitav Ghosh is the author of several acclaimed works of fiction and non-fiction, including The Shadow Lines, The Glass Palace, and The Ibis Trilogy. His work has been translated into more than 30 languages, and he's the recipient of several awards, including the Nyan Peet Award, uh, for which, uh, which is India's highest literary honor, and uh, he is the first English writer to receive this. Amitav Ghosh will speak to us about the making and the execution of the book, and that will be followed by a conversation with historian and uh, Bangalore City's very own Ramchandra Guha. Ram Guha's books include a pioneering social history of sport, a landmark history of independent India, and an authoritative two-volume biography of Mahatma Gandhi. We'll have an audience Q&A at the end, and that will be followed by book signing, which will be outside the auditorium. With that, I'd like to welcome on stage Udayan Mitra, executive publisher, HarperCollins Publishing India. Thank you, Sri Krishna. Um, good evening, everybody. Wonderful to see a full house. Um, and this is not all of it, I know that. Um, my name is Udayan Mitra. I'm executive publisher, as Sri Krishna said, at uh, HarperCollins India. And a uh, great pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of the publishers uh, to the Bangalore launch of Amitav Ghosh's new book, uh, Smoke and Ashes. And um, I, again, as Sri Krishna said, uh, this evening's program is hosted jointly by Bangalore International Center, the Bangalore Literature Festival, and HarperCollins. So we're going to have a talk, a presentation more, more like it, by Amitav, uh, which is based on Smoke and Ashes. And uh, following, following Amitav's talk, he'll be in conversation with, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, He'll be in conversation with Ramchandra Guha, after which we'll take questions from the audience. And uh, Amitav is also going to be available to sign copies of the book uh, after the event, so if any of you want to get your copies signed. Uh, Sri Krishna has already introduced both Amitav and Ram Guha, uh, both of whom, <laughs> of course, need no introduction from the, uh, from the publisher. So I'm going to skip all of that. We want to cut to the chase. Um, and uh, I will just, uh, I would just like to say a few words about Smoke and Ashes, which we are delighted to publish uh, and, and we are privileged to publish. So this is um, his first major nonfiction book in several years. And Smoke and Ashes recounts the fascinating journey. It's a journey into economic, social, cultural history that Amitav undertook as he researched and then wrote the Ibis Trilogy. And he tells us how the discoveries that he made influenced him, both as a writer and as a person. He peels layer after layer of perceptions and understandings of Indian and Chinese history, trade patterns, cultural imperatives. And as he does so, our view of the past that has shaped the world that we inhabit today expands progressively and gains a deeper, sharper focus. Uh, th those of you who have had the good fortune to read the book already know what I'm talking about. I won't expand on this because in, in the conversation with, with Ram Guha, uh, both Amitav and Ram will talk about you know, how, how our understanding of history is keeps being defined and redefined uh, as, as we gain new perspectives, as we gain new information. Smoke and Ashes is not just an excursion into history. It's not just a memoir. It's not just a travelogue. It's not just a deep dive into the repercussions of colonialism and the opium trade. It's all of these things and more. It's quite simply one of the most powerful and arresting books of our time. I'm so glad that Amitav Ghosh wrote Smoke and Ashes. And I, uh, as, as the publisher, um, I can only say that we're privileged uh, to be publishing this. Uh, we, we are 
the very first, HarperCollins India is the very first publisher in the world to publish Smoke and Ashes. It's an international book. It will come out in the UK and US in several months' time. But Amitav actually wanted the book to be edited and published in India. And I'm very, very pleased about that. Thank you so much. I would uh, now like to call on stage uh, Amitav Ghosh. He's somewhere in the wings. Thank you, Amitav, for that. No, uh, I was reflecting, Amitav and I go back a very long time. <clears throat> As he said, and I'm not going to begin at the beginning, but I'm going to uh, just start with <clears throat> a visit Amitav made to our city 15 years ago, where the first volume of the IBS trilogy was released. Uh, the Sea of Poppies, and uh, I was privileged to be part of uh, that event too. It was held in a hotel, uh, regrettably held in a hotel because the Bangalore International Center did not exist then. And uh, it's wonderful to see what has changed, not just in Amitabh's life and my life in these last 15 years, uh, but how, when we are discussing a book a work of history that emerges from uh, a novelistic trilogy uh, that we have this fabulous space. And so I'd like to begin by uh, just thanking all who made the BIC possible. Uh, and a lot of people like Amitabh and many others uh, who when they visit here, not to be confined in a hotel where many people, especially young people, are inhibited from showing their faces. Now, as I said, the book is a sequel, non-fiction sequel to that novelistic series. It is about opium in the making of the modern world. Now, the book lies, <coughs> Smoke and Ashes lies, in the distinguished tradition of histories of humanity written through the plants that human beings have cultivated and exploited. Arguably the first book in uh, this kind of lineage uh, was a now largely forgotten book published in 1949 by R.N. Salomon called The History and uh, Social Influence of the Potato. All right, again, uh, in fact, it was my teacher, Dharma Kumar, who first told me about that book. Uh, then you have a book uh, written by Amitabh's fellow anthropologist, Sidney Mintz, Sweetness and Power, about sugar. More recently, you have Stephen Beckett's Global History of Cotton. Uh, now, these, Amitabh says in his book, that it's about a plant that is at once, I think, agent and instrument. And that's the kind of tradition that the book lies in. But of course, uh, it's different, uh, in part because Amitav um, uh, has both uh, training in history and writes novels. He's also introduced elements of memoir. And as uh, his presentation really briefly shows, it's actually not a history, but multiple histories, as the subtitle uh, underlines. So these histories are economic, political, military, social, cultural, and even botanical. Uh, in our conversation, I hope we'll touch on some of these histories, Amitabh. But I'd first like to begin with um, the two countries or civilizations that are at the heart of this story, India and China. You start early on in your book by recalling that when you were growing up in Calcutta, you say, I had no interest whatsoever in Chinese history, geography, or culture, even though China, uh, Calcutta has a Chinatown. You say, I had no interest in Chinese history, geography, or culture. It was by accident uh, you discovered that though China was absent in your mental world, it was uh, present in different ways in your material world. Now, this is, of course, yours is, of course, the typical experience of the Indian literate classes all through the 20th century. Probably every person in this room above the age of 50, shall we say. Uh, the Indian literate classes have looked to the West for influence and inspiration, but were utterly disinterested in China. Now, there was arguably one exception, who was Rabindranath Tagore, yeah. uh, and, uh, and because who reacted intensely to China, and of course, China also reacted to him. But I don't want to um, uh, you know, talk anymore about Tagore because uh, that may take the whole evening. And that will make our disagreements very visible. <laughs> All right. But I want to I ask you, Amitabh, is uh, that uh, uh, in your travels and studies about China, 
your travels around China and your studies about China. Did you discover a similar lack of interest in India and Indian culture, both in the past and in the present? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. You know, the thing about it is that uh, I remember when I went off, uh, you know, uh, to study at Oxford, I had the option of studying any place I, uh, I wanted. And I decided to, uh, you know, to study the Middle East, basically because I conceived, I knew about, you know, historical connections between India and that part of the Indian Ocean. But uh, it never even occurred to me, uh, you know, to think about China because China was literally an empty space in a map. I mean, you know, I've always, you know, we were both taught geography by a wonderful teacher. And so we always knew the place, uh, you, you know, the cities in the world and so on. But if you would ask me, like, uh, you, you know, even 15 years ago, where is Hangzhou? You know, where is Fuzhou? I wouldn't have known. I mean, it's incredible to think. I mean, Hangzhou is one of the most amazing cities in the world. You know, not only does it have a pop population of 20 million, it literally is one of the most beautiful urban spaces you will ever see. I mean, the West Lake in Hangzhou is just a, a miracle of urban design coming through the uh, coming uh, through uh, like two centuries. Uh, what am I saying? Two millennia. Uh, it's just uh, an astonishing thing that you know we are just not sort of interested. We just don't know about this. And if you, you know, uh, Calcutta has a direct flight to Kunming. Uh, two and a half, it takes like two and a half hours, almost as long as it takes to get to Delhi. But nobody, you know, I never, it never occurred to me until I started writing this Ibis trilogy. And then I, when my son was 17 and about to go off to college, uh, we went and traveled around, uh, we traveled around Yunnan, which is literally, uh, I, I would say, just one of the most enchanting places uh, you can see. It's just so beautiful. And uh, anyway, so I think that was very much the case with our generation that uh, we, uh, we just, I mean, China was just blank for us. I suppose a partial exception would be the communists. But, uh, yeah. Who are enchanted by you know, China? I mean, in an abstract way, China's chairman is our chairman, but nothing, nothing more than that. Uh, no, actually, if you look at, uh, if you look, in as much as there is any kind of Indian scholarship on China, it's almost all produced by people from uh, Eastern India. Yeah, you know, from Assam, from uh, uh, from Dwarra, Indians. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a very striking thing. I mean that, uh, in fact, almost all specialists on uh, on China are from Eastern India, and a couple from Gujarat. Again, you you because of that long tradition. So yeah, I mean, uh, and let's face it. I think it's this, uh, you know, Indian policy making, Indian thinking, and so on, is so much dominated by the Hindi speaking heartland, yeah. and I think they have those same kinds of visceral responses towards China as they have towards North, Northeast India. So not to put too fine a point on it, I think there is a certain kind of racism almost. I think that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is the legacy of colonialism and you're always looking west. Yeah. So of course we don't even look, I mean, to further east to Java and um, you know, uh, uh, Cambodia and places like that. Uh, but in China, I mean, were the Chinese as uh, magisterially indifferent? Have they been to India? You know, uh, I think uh, India doesn't loom very large uh, in their in their worldview. It really doesn't. In one sense, it doesn't, but in another sense, everywhere you go uh, in uh, in China, India is omnipresent. You know, simply because of the Buddhist connection. I mean, any temple you go to will have the Bodhi Dharma. Uh, you know, outside the the most important image that you walk past is the Bodhi Dharma, who's uh, who was a Tamil. Uh, you know. And every every temple will have a frieze of the you know the uh, sacred books coming across the um, coming across the Himalaya. So everywhere you look, actually, uh, there's there are these references. I mean, you know, created I suppose most of all by the Buddhist connection, but uh, they have I would say in the contemporary world now, in as much as India relates to China, it's through a sort of international relation, strategic studies kind of discourse. Yeah, right. And I think the same is true at that end, you know. But it's a curious thing. I mean, uh, it's not, I mean, I went to the Shanghai uh, Book Fair when, you know, my Ibis trilogy was coming out. And I can tell you, I was just overwhelmed by the, by literally the affection that people showed. Uh, 
you know, they would come with their children, put their children in my lap, and the line stretched forever, the signing line. Uh, it, was, it was literally overwhelming. And wherever I've been in, uh, in China, I've had just such interesting conversations with uh, intellectuals, uh, you know, with university students and so on. Uh, it's been uh, very, very interesting in that way, uh, you know. So coming to your book, Amitabh, uh, you know, uh, one of the, uh, as I said, it's, it's multiple histories and around a certain plant. Uh, and you pay careful attention to all aspects of the business. So the conditions of cultivation, uh, uh, which you briefly mentioned, but we can talk about that later. Production, as also the factories you, distribution, consumption, and profit making. Uh, you speak of its use in pre-modern times, but then you write, and I'm quoting from your book, you write, the nexus between state power and trade, so characteristic of mercantilist Europe, slowly but surely turned opium into something it had never been before, namely an instrument of state policy. Uh, you, and you, of course, explain that in much of your book, and it was one of the uh, latter chapters you uh, suggest, based on uh, studies by uh, economic historians, that as much as 20% of the British Raj's revenues came from opium. And indirectly, you also say this doesn't, doesn't account for the spin-off industries such as shipbuilding and transportation, which were also linked to opium. Now, can you expand on the role of the opium trade in the consolidation and perpetuation of imperial power? I mean, in your in your wonderful illustrated presentation, of, of you focused more on its origins and its expansion, but in the consolidation and perpetuation of uh, imperial power, including, of course, through warfare and inducement and coercion, some of the things you talked about in the book. So it'll be, I mean, that's something I think maybe the audience would want to hear about. Uh, I, opium was absolutely fundamental, uh, uh, not just to the British Empire, but also uh, the, the opium uh, trade as an instrument of state policy was really pioneered by the Dutch. Uh, so the Dutch, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, actually the weird thing is that the tr uh, conditions of trade in the Indian Ocean were much, much freer than they were in the in the Mediterranean. In the Mediterranean, these uh, these uh, monopolies were very common. So one of the reasons why the Portuguese and Spanish and so on uh, set off to look for the Spice Islands was simply in order to break the Venetian monopoly on the spice trade. Uh, in the same way, uh, you know, the Venetians, uh, along with the, in cooperation with the Fatimids and so on in, in Egypt, established this very lucrative uh, uh, trade monopoly on spices. So. So they set off, uh, you know, to break that monopoly. But from the start, the Dutch, the Portuguese, everybody, uh, they saw themselves as, as merchants, but also as soldiers, as servants of the state. So the day they arrive, uh, literally, uh, at the Spice Islands, wherever they went, they are in search of monopolies. They want to, uh, they want to impose these monopolies. And the Dutch, in fact, uh, in the Banda Islands, where, which produced nutmeg, uh, they eventually just uh, killed off the entire population in order to establish this, uh, this monopoly. But the Dutch also discovered that you know, uh, they, could, uh, uh, they could gain favors amongst uh, the, uh, you know, there was a many, many small states, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the East Indies. Uh, so they started uh, trading opium to them. And, uh, you know, opium uh, thereby caught on in the courts of the, of the small kingdoms of, uh, of the East Indies. Then the Dutch started using that same tactic in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the Malabar. You know, Om Prakash, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, he, um, yeah, so, uh, they started using that tactic in the Malabar. And you know, this is the weird thing about opium, that once a supply is provided, right. it takes off on its own. And that's the sense in which it's a maker of history. So uh, you know, the uh, opium became very popular in Malabar, and they tried to use opium to establish a monopoly on pepper, but never succeeded. So uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the mid 18th century, there was a very clear, uh, there was a very clear uh, policy established by European states of using opium uh, to, uh, you know, basically to just, uh, how shall I say, to addict, <laughs> you know, a lot of people. And uh, so Southeast Asia had that, and then from Southeast Asia. So the British adopted the same policy in relation to China. But uh, every single major uh, uh, colonial power basically uh, was able to sustain itself because of the opium trade. 
The French did this in, uh, in Indochina. You know, this is a strange part of it. Their argument always was that Asiatics, because, uh, because of their racial proclivities, are prone to degeneracy or, and depravity, you know? In fact, every Asian state that could resisted opium, you know, bitterly resisted it. So even the Konbaung dynasty uh, in Burma resisted it. The, the, uh, the dynasties in Siam resisted it. Uh, everyone tried, to, but the, the Dutch and then the English just forced them, you know, destroyed the armies and said, uh, if you don't keep your uh, ports open to opium, uh, we are just going to, uh, we're just going to uh, defeat you militarily. So there was a string of small opium wars fought across the East Indies. And ultimately, it culminated in the biggest opium war, which was that of 1839 to 41 uh, in China. You, know, you, uh, you have an interesting uh, uh, discussion of um, claims, uh, somewhat tendentious claims made by the British state in India, that pre-British states uh, uh, enjoyed a monopoly of opium. And I was um, uh, you know, reminded of uh, the history of forestry, because when uh, you know, the, the forest department, by the way, is the biggest landlord in India. It controls 23% of the land, land. And when the British took over all these forests, they used a similar precision. You know, that uh, uh, the, the Mauryas had elephant forests. Tipu had a monopoly of a sandalwood. But actually, that was not true. Most of yeah. you know, the states... And when this argument was disputed by a dissenting colonial official who pointed out that large tracts of land, in fact, the majority of woodland was under the control of Adivasi and peasant communities, a British forest officer called C.F. Amory, incidentally the father of uh, Leo Amory, who later became Secretary of State, disputed this and rejected it in a, in, a, in a major conference in Shimla, where he said, the right of conquest is the strongest of all rights. It is a right against which there is no appeal. Which is true enough. Which is true enough, right. So I was, your, your book, uh, what are the parallels in your book, uh, which maybe you'd like to elaborate on, you make, you talk about, the history of slavery and slave trade. And you say, I quote, um, like opium, in the case of slavery, the Europeans took a pre-existing small-scale practice and expanded it by orders of magnitude. Uh, namely, they didn't invent it, but they really used it to far more deadly effect. And maybe there's a whole book to be waiting to be written comparing slavery and opium. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, uh, that connection, occurs constantly in the literature. And I rather self-consciously avoid it. This is the only occasion in which I've, uh, uh, I've touched upon it. Mm. Uh, because I think, you know, slavery, the suffering is so direct and so, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of, yeah. I think one should make categorical differences, you know. But in relation to slavery, uh, a, a new book has just come out. It's a very interesting book. Uh, uh, on slavery, uh, it's by uh, it's by uh, a, a Mozambican scholar in England, and he, using seventeenth uh, and eighteenth century documents, actually shows that you know slavery was not a pre-existing practice uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. You know what happened is that slavery has a very long history in the Mediterranean. Of course, you know, bondage of various kinds has a long history everywhere. But chattel slavery mm. has a very long history in the Mediterranean. You know, Greece, uh, I mean, Athens was two-thirds uh, course, slaves. Yeah, yeah. Sparta was even more. And so on. I mean, they had these slave systems of production. Whereas in India, we had bonded labor and so on, but not really slave labor production. So... It was the same in Africa. They had various forms of kinship uh, where in, uh, uh, in internecine conflict, if people were captured, they were incorporated into different lineages. This is not even really comparable to chattel slavery. Yeah. So it's really the Portuguese, again, who invent this whole thing when they start the sugarcane plantations in the Canaries. Yeah. They need, uh, they need uh, enslaved labor in order to make this model work. So they force uh, a whole string of uh, kingdoms in, in West Africa to start selling. Uh, you know, they, they trap them in debt, and then they make them pay off the debt by uh, handing, over, handing over personnel. Uh, 
But uh, you know, again, with the with the whole story of slavery, one of the interesting things is that the whole story of abolition uh, is presented as solely a sort of uh, you know a gift from uh, the great white white master. man's guilt. White oh, man's yeah, guilt. That's right. Yeah. yeah Whereas well, nothing yeah. of the kind. I mean, you know, uh, uh, black uh, black people resisted course, for yeah. centuries yeah. and even uh, presented arguments. Yeah. So this book that I was talking about, uh, he's uh, based his arguments on a 17th century uh, uh, African prince who goes to Rome and tries to work for the abolition of slavery. So uh, return to your book and comparisons compar comparisons within your book. Uh, you know, your book throws uh, a lot of light on the comparative histories of the two great Indian cities, Kolkata and Mumbai. Uh, you know, you show how, which you again, in your slides you only briefly mentioned, how opium cultivation in the East started under colonial law species in the West, more autonomous peasants, you know, had a greater, greater say. The opium traders in Kolkata were largely British, in Mumbai, substantially Indian. And uh, you, of course, you also talk about Madras and the fact that Madras never had an opium kind of trade, so maybe languished economically and politically compared to Kolkata and Mumbai. But then you say this difference in how opium was cultivated and, of course, uh, marketed and, and uh, profited from, uh, you suggest this explains, helps explain, yeah. uh, Kolkata's later economic decline uh, as opposed to Mumbai's enduring com commercial viability. And I found that most interesting. So maybe you'd like to elaborate on that. Yeah, sure. So uh, as I said, uh, you know, uh, the opium production in Eastern India was completely controlled by the East India Company. And this was a very draconian regime, this opium department uh, actually employed armies of spies, of uh, barkandazes, uh, various kinds of enforcers. I mean, they literally had a paramilitary force uh, which enforced uh, the, uh, the rules of the opium department. So there was a huge structure of surveillance. Uh, all, uh, uh, you know, all the income that was generated in this region went straight back into, into, this, in, into these systems of surveillance and enforcement. Uh, you know, so what you had in Eastern India is in a way comparable to what is now called the resource curse. So we speak of the resource curse in relation to, let's say, uh, silver mines or gold mines. But, you know, with a silver mine or a gold mine, uh, you can check uh, the people who are going into work in the mine as they go in and as they come out, and you can you can surveil them in that way. And in any case, a gold mine lasts maybe a hundred years or something, or a silver mine similarly. But what you have happening in Purvanchal is that they are producing this incredibly valuable article on the fields so renewably. You know, so basically every single person who's working in that district has to be under constant surveillance. Anyone who walks past an opium field has to be surveilled, you know, and in some parts, you know, this system still, uh, this, uh, this system still exists. So what you see in Eastern India really is, and these peasants are producing opium well below cost. You know, can you imagine? I mean, this is the most valu valuable commodity uh, that British India produces by weight. And uh, it's produced uh, below cost by these impoverished peasants who have to continue producing opium even in seasons when there's outbreaks of famine. And massive outbreaks of famine start in the late 18th century when the British start converting uh, uh, you know, a lot of agricultural land uh, to opium. So. This is a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very destructive model, a social model, and there's, uh, there, uh, there's a reason why uh, uh, the, uh, the War of 1857 breaks out in exactly this region. Mm. And the first, uh, and the first uh, uh, institutions that are targeted are actually the opium uh, institutions, you know. In Western India, it's produced in a completely different way. The British didn't actually want, they thought they could maintain uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the monopoly over opium production uh, in uh, Eastern India. But of course, you know, people find out and that there had always been a little, um, a little bit of opium produced in Malwa as well. And when they see the British <laughs> minting money from opium, they also decide to start uh, uh, planting, uh, 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 planting opium over there. Now, the difference between the two regions is political. 
because the Maratha states uh, put up very stiff resistance against the British, uh, especially the Sindhyas, and uh, you know fight the British literally to a standstill. In fact, they inflict major defeats on them in the late 18th, uh, in the late 18th century. It's not till 1803, and the critical date in Indian history, if you ask me, uh, is the uh, is 1803 and the Battle of Assaye, uh, where the British, uh, and in fact the greatest military uh, genius of his time, uh, the Duke of Wellington. Uh, uh, inflicts a resounding defeat on the Sindhyas, uh, you know, and to the end of his life, you know, when the Duke of Wellington was asked what was his most important battle, he didn't say Waterloo. Uh, he said it was Asaye. You know, it was, a, it was the closest thing that he had ever fought. So, but even after this defeat, uh, the Marathas continued to be very strong. The Sindhyas had uh, very large uh, armies. So the British couldn't just tell them what to do. You know, they had to negotiate with them. And so uh, there was, of course, the Sindhyas, but also the Holkars and many other uh, minor principalities. So these, uh, these uh, principalities were able to provide cover uh, to the mercantile networks of the region, which thereafter began to ship opium to China on a very large scale through Bombay. The British also profited from this trade because they started taxing opium that was going through Bombay. But it took them a long time to shut down the, uh, the smuggling routes. In fact, they invaded Sindh. Uh, the reason they really invaded Sindh was to, uh, because uh, a lot of opium was going through Karachi, but they, want, uh, they wanted to profit from it uh, you know, solely in Bombay. So Bombay, at one point, had uh, almost been abandoned by the British because it was a very expensive um, uh, station to maintain. But once the opium trade started on a large scale, that became Bombay's lifeline. And Bombay was literally kept afloat by opium. So, uh, you know, but Bombay, because of this history, the British were not able to establish a complete dominance over Bombay. In Bombay, the mercantile networks, because they had access to a hinterland of opium, uh, the uh, foreign traders were always dependent on them. Uh, so for example, uh, all the big Gujarati networks, uh, you know, uh, and it, you know, it's a myth that it was only the Parsis. The Parsis were uh, a, a fraction of the trade. Uh, the most important traders were, um, you know, there were lots of uh, uh, Maharashtrians, there were lots of uh, Gujarati Hindus, uh, there were lots of Sindhi Hindus also involved, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the trade. Uh, the only difference with the Parsis is the Parsis actually traveled to Canton, uh, to Guangzhou uh, uh, with opium, which most other Indian communities didn't, probably because of caste restrictions or something like that. You have some interesting um, uh, paragraphs of the Parsi presence in, in yeah. Guangzhou. Yeah. Uh, your book, Amitav, is a sharp indictment of colonial rule and of colonial hypocrisy too. And you write, I quote, uh, no matter how genteel their manners, no matter how earnest their religious fervor, the British and American traders in Guangzhou belonged to an Anglo-American elite that had made a fine art of spouting pieties of, pieties of various kinds while inflicting immeasurable harm on people around the world. Now, this is eloquently put, and I entirely agree that Western colonialism was hip hypocritical and self-serving, apart from being exercising political domination and uh, economic exploitation. But is it this kind of hypocrisy true of all cultural and political elites. I mean, you think of uh, having Brahmins down the ages, and some even today, and particularly in the last decade or so, begun to sp spout pieties from the Vedas and Upanishads while treating Dalits and women as subhuman, that we may agree on, but even more perhaps pertinently, what about Stalinist commissars and their preaching of equality and their practice of oppression? I mean, isn't this, in a sense, common to all elites? They are self-serving, hypocritical, and attach an ideological, uh, a sophisticated ideological veneer to justify their methods of exploitation. Look, uh, I mean, obviously, you, uh, inequalities of all kinds have always existed. And, uh, you know, the issue of hypocrisy arises when you are talking about uh, whether you believe, uh, you know, the justifications of those, uh, of those uh, you know, forms of uh, inequality. And it's perfectly possible that in the Middle Ages, uh, in, uh, in Britain, I mean, in Europe, as in India, people believed that there was a natural sort of inequality. I mean, you know, they, they had the great chain of being, which was very simple, uh, similar to uh, ideologies of uh, inequality uh, elsewhere. 
I think what actually happens in the 18th and 19th centuries in the wake of the European Enlightenment is that a new, a new kind of thinking emerges, you know, where abstractions of various kinds are invented to, as it were, remove, uh, to remove human agency, if you like. So for the, for example, Europeans, even as they're killing, uh, literally, they're instrumental in the extermination of countless millions of uh, Native Americans, uh, they constantly blame this on what they call nature. They say nature has natural laws. So they are dying because of natural laws uh, in relation to pathogens or whatever, or also in relation to their racial composition, which is weak and so on. But this completely ignores the fact that they're actually mobilizing and instrumentalizing various kinds of uh, non-human forces. These non-human forces include pathogens, they include livestock, which uh, immediately begin to destroy uh, Native American. Alfred Crosby's book, Ecological Imperialism. Is That's right. Talks about Absolutely. All yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, they completely weaponize all these uh, non-human forces, uh, which begin to inflict this damage. But they absolve themselves and they say, we are not responsible. It's nature. Similarly to climate denial right now. Uh, you know, they'd say, oh, we're not responsible. It's nature. Nature is doing this. So similarly, what happens in the late 18th century onwards is basically you have the Scottish Enlightenment. Uh, you have Adam Smith coming up with these ideas of the market. And then uh, you have this idea of free trade, you know, which so the the idea of, uh, of, of free trade is simply that there is uh, supply and then there's demand and uh, the market creates a balance between the two. So the reason, the way in which these British traders and no doubt Parsi traders and others also justify what they're doing to themselves is by saying there is a demand and if we did not meet this demand with our supply, someone else would, you know. But you know, this is the really bizarre thing because what this mode of thinking really does is that it removes all the ethical constraints that historically people placed on trade. And these ethical constraints existed everywhere. They existed in China, they existed in India, they existed everywhere. Because actually capitalism, you know, various forms of enterprise have also always existed, you know. So the real innovation of this idea, of this ideology of free trade is to destroy uh, the notion that there should be any kind of ethical constraint. You know, and this is what Lin Jeju says repeatedly to the British, that don't you realize that, that by doing this, you are actually dooming your own people eventually, which has come, uh, come to be true now. So, you know, this is the weird thing. They're talking about supply and demand and demand as it were pre-existing supply while they're dealing with the substance that actually completely contradicts this law. With opium, supply creates demand. It's not that demand creates supply, it's the other way around. So for example, the Sackler family in America, when they started uh, marketing OxyContin, there was, no, there was no demand for OxyContin, you know, uh, for these opioids. Within two or three years through canny marketing, but most of all by making uh, supplies of uh, op opiates are widely available, they created this phenomenal demand. So that within 12 years, you have this incredible opioid crisis, so that today, uh, opioids are the leading cause of death in America. You know, 700, more than 700 people dying every day. You know, in a, in a four year period, opioids killed more people in America than uh, the Second World War did. Uh, so I have a, I don't know how much time we'll have for audience questions, but I have a couple of things I'd like to ask you. One is uh, about your intellectual trajectory, uh, more broadly. Uh, you know, um, it is to do with your lifelong interest in science and the non-human world. Uh, you, uh, neither of us studied science after school. I come from a family of scientists. Uh, I don't know whether uh, you do, but... Uh, I come from a family of animists. Uh, animists, okay. But which makes your lifelong interest in science and the no lifelong professional interest, post, 
post university interest. So striking. I mean, it's very unusual for an uh, Indian anthropologist or writer. You know, you know the divide in our universities between arts and sciences and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but if I look at, you know, the arc of your work, I mean, you've written in your novels, uh, you've touched on pseudosciences too, like phrenology, but real uh, visible uh, issues such as malaria and attempts to control it, plants, climate, as manifest in your recent work. Now, where did this come from? You know, I mean, the only time I have actually, in all the stuff that I've done, remotely connected to the world of science and of the non-human world, is when I wrote on forests. And that was partly because the, the work was done in collaboration with the scientist, Madhav Gadgil. I mean, it didn't really come from within me. But your work has, you know, in different kinds of manifestations. So I was wondering, is it Bengali science writing? Is it, uh, uh, is it your uh, early mentor, J.P.S. Oboroi, a sociologist interested in science? I just thought, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. I think you're being too modest, Ram. I mean, uh, you know, you're, uh, you, you pioneered uh, environmental history in India. Your early work on environmental history remains to this day a benchmark for so many of us, and so many of us have learned from it. Your work on Chipko, you didn't do with Madhav Gadgil, you did it on your own. Uh, so uh, you completely pioneered that. And I think it's interesting that both of us have had uh, th uh, these interests uh, evolving, though from different directions. But uh, it's probably because I sometimes think about it, and I, I think it may have had something to do with the nature of our schooling, where we were constantly exposed uh, you know, to the mountains and the forests and so on. I certainly think that has something to do with it. But uh, for me, certainly, uh, as I said, uh, you know, I think you came to it through science, and I came to it through animism, <laughs> if you like. Uh, OK, uh, so um, one last question. Your book is, among other things, about a great power rivalry. I mean, India is one part of it, but a great power rivalry between China and Great Britain. Can you talk about these two uh, great civilizations at either end of the European Eurasian landmass? Uh, so it's about a great power rivalry between China and Great Britain, with India and Indians directly and perhaps indirectly maybe more indirectly and inadvertently aiding the latter, that is Britain, uh, in this great power rivalry. We now live in a world dominated by the China-America rivalry. What might be India's role in shaping its future contours? Should it ally with either or both or neither? Are we in danger of being a kind of, um, uh, you know, caught and having to take sides as we were in the 18th and 19th centuries? Uh, the rivalry really isn't just between Great Britain and China. It's between the Anglosphere and uh, because, uh, uh, you know, the Americans act. Yeah, so you, have, you do, do have a couple of very interesting chapters on, yeah. on the Boston Brahmins and so on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. But today, so let's look at today. I mean, right, well, I think for me, well, you, you know all three countries very well. I mean, you're Indian, you lived for many years in America, and of course now you've spent the last decade and a half uh, in many ways writing about China. I, I wouldn't claim to be an expert on China or a historian of China or anything like that, but it's perfectly clear to me, what became perfectly clear to me, that this fundamental dynamic uh, of uh, contestation and competition between China and the Anglosphere has been basically the fundamental driver of modernity. And uh, you know, now, again, we are seeing it in full-fledged form. I mean, China's enormous decline had a lot to do with opium and the opium trade. But, you know, uh, they are also the only country that has ever successfully combated uh, mass addiction. I don't think that history is ever going to be repeated anywhere else. And it's a very striking thing today that when you look at what's happening in America, uh, it very, it, to an uncanny degree, it really uh, mirrors what happened in China in the 19th century. You know, there's a kind of civilizational shock, mass addiction, and so on. So, uh, you know, where will this lead? I think we are seeing an enormous geopolitical upheaval as we speak, uh, you know, uh, across the Eurasian landmass. Uh, you know, the West has, I mean, that is to say, uh, Europeans, have been dominant in the world for like uh, four centuries. And we suddenly see, uh, you know, a new world order emerging. Uh, 
what uh, what awaits us at the other end, we can't say. You know, uh, it's but this is a time of extreme geopolitical instability, and uh, you know, uh, along with you know, there have been periods of geopolitical instability in the world in the past, but this time it's happening in conjunction with multiple other crises, you know, biodiversity loss, climate change, uh, mass migrations, political instability of various kinds. I mean, who would have thought even 10 years ago that yeah. a country so stable as Britain yeah, uh, would so yeah. rapidly begin uh, eviscerating itself? Yeah. So I think it's up for grabs. I, I don't think the world has ever been as unstable as it is today. I don't think, uh, you know, it's a hard thing to say, but I don't think uh, we've ever confronted a future as dark as this. Well, uh, on, uh, on that note, we still have a few, uh, we have time for a few questions. So would, would people come up here? Come up here, there's a, there's a mic right here. Uh, you can just brief, yeah, right here. Hello, Mr. Ghosh, how nice to see you again from nutmeg to opium, a journey. <laughs> um, yes, my actually your last uh, comment, Ram, was probably a good segue into what I was thinking about, which was how did the um, East India Company and the British, the, how did they control the permeation of opium, this explosive uh, demanding substance, uh, into the West in the 18th century? That's a very interesting question. So, uh, uh, opium did actually circulate uh, a, a lot uh, in the West as well. But the, uh, the grade of opium that circulated in the West was basically uh, of a low grade uh, opium, you know, medicinal, so almost you might say medicinal opium. So just as opium continues to circulate uh, today uh, as various kinds, in various kinds of medications, but heroin is banned, you know. So similarly, what the East India Company was producing for, for China was a very high grade of opium, which they call Chandu opium. You know, so this Chandu, uh, once it's exported, it can be treated in various ways. It has to be sort of cooked to make smoking grade opium possible. And the way that opium was consumed uh, in China and in uh, Southeast Asia was that it was mainly smoked. So, uh, you know, I've, it's an argument I've presented in the book at some length. So the British and Americans actually really believed that it was physically impossible for people of the white race uh, to smoke opium. So, uh, you know, uh, they discovered that this was not the case eventually, but the, the, by that time it was the 1880s and it was too late. And, uh, you know, uh, America went through several major uh, opioid crises, you know, uh, because opioids were widely prescribed for after the Civil War for pain and so on. So it's a, it's a long, it's a very long story, but the way that they managed to exclude opium in the beginning was simply through social usage. Uh, that, uh, you know, opium, uh, smoking opium was incredibly stigmatized as it was in India. That's why, uh, you know, India didn't take to smoking opium. And the reason this was possible is simply because India had a very long exposure, like, uh, like uh, for example, Iran uh, or uh, Turkey, it had a very long exposure to opium. So it, again, it's like an opportunistic pathogen. You know, if, you, if your population is exposed to this for a long time, they develop other protocols. And in India, the choice of psychoactive, uh, the psychoactive of choice was always cannabis, uh, you know, in various forms. So that also, I think, helped to restrict the circulation of opium. Um, and that's why I think it's really uh, it's really crazy to uh, for the government now to try and fight uh, cannabis, uh, you know, uh, because if anything, that serves as a prophylactic against very highly addictive forms of drugs like uh, heroin or fentanyl. And you know, today in India, we have a massive uh, opioid problem. Uh, opioids are basically destabilizing northeastern India, they're destabilizing Punjab, and this is only going to spread. You know, uh, I'm glad you mentioned cannabis. You mentioned it in your book also, and the need to legalize it. You know, many younger people here would not know that when 
uh, Amit Tab and I were students. Yeah. Uh, in most North Indian states, cannabis was legal. I remember going to the uh, festival in IIT Kanpur, and opposite the Kanpur railway station, buying it from a government theka shop at three rupees a tola. Yeah. And it was Nancy Reagan's war on drugs that persuaded Rajiv Gandhi to ban it. You know, yeah. so it should be legal everywhere. You know, absolutely. I mean, you remember that? You absolutely. You must you must be three rupees a tola, <laughs> tola as well. Right. Okay. But then, the next question. Hi, Mr. Ghosh. It's not particularly related to this book, but most of my work is in northeastern India. I'm working with uh, indigenous communities there. There is a history of indentured laborers coming in from China into Singpo and Makum to grow tea. And there is also, um, in the oral histories, there is a tradition of talking about opium also being rampant there. Is there a connection between that and the rampant opium problem that the North northeastern state faces right now? Uh, uh, you know, it's a curious thing. So opium smoking was uh, uh, stigmatized across a lot, of, uh, a lot of India, especially peninsular India and uh, middle India. The only part of India where uh, opium was widely smoked was Assam and the, North, and the Northeast, uh, including Upper Bengal. So the Rangpur district in what is now Bangladesh, uh, they had a huge uh, a crisis of uh, opium smoking going back to the early 19th century. So that may have some sort of connection with it, but certainly, uh, you know, by, the, by, uh, by independence, Assam was facing a massive opioid crisis. Those who want to ask her to give, come up to so save time. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm thinking about the, you just mentioned the war on drugs, and uh, also about how we've mostly been talking about this macro level history of um, opium. Um, but also this book by Michael Pollan, um, This Is Your Mind on Plants, which brings it quite a bit uh, closer to the self and the individual. And I'm just wondering if you have anything to say about how a more intimate connection with um, the history of, of addictive or, or psychoactive or habit-forming substances can maybe change our collective um, attitudes towards criminalizing drugs versus, I don't know, creating a space for maybe more empathetic views on, on substance use in general. Uh, that's a very good question, and I think one has to be very careful there. You know, I think the basic mistake is to club all these substances together as drugs. You know, all human societies have, all, have used uh, psychoactive substances of some kind, almost always botanical, or they've used other techniques like meditation or, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, to uh, you know, alter their, alter their uh, state of consciousness. Uh, a lot of these substances are now, uh, we know, now enormously be beneficial, like psilocybin mushrooms and, uh, you know, Native Americans before the introduction of alcohol uh, actually had over 120 kinds of uh, psychoactive substances. Now these, the human relationship with these psychoactive substances was very different from the human relationship with opioids or cocainoids, uh, because I make a distinction in my book between what I call grassroots psychoactives, such as uh, marijuana, psilocybin mushrooms, uh, datura, uh, toddy, or whatever. Uh, you know, because that, th uh, these have uh, histories that go back, you know, thousands of years. And humans probably started using these substances because they observed animals using these substances. Because we know that animals also like psychoactive substances of various kinds. So because humans have this long history with all these uh, psychoactive substances, they developed certain protocols for using them, you know? Uh, and I think that's what always kept these substances uh, under a certain kind of control. Now the social history of opium is very different from that of psychoactive substances, uh, of these grassroots uh, psychoactives. Opium really, takes, uh, you know, occupies uh, the world stage on a large scale only in the 16th century onwards, you know. And it's largely the work of colonial powers uh, to make it, to give it this, uh, this incredible ubiquity uh, in the world. Uh, 
So that's, I think, one of the reasons why uh, uh, opium is completely different from these other psychoactive substances, you know, and should be treated differently. Uh, how they should be treated, I don't know, because I'm not, I'm not, a, uh, I'm not an, a sort of policy expert. But certainly one thing you can see today, it's very clear, that every attempt to control opium has failed. You know, uh, legalization has failed. Uh, opium uh, was legal in China from 1860 to 1906. Uh, uh, you know, throughout this period, addiction just soared. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Holland has a very sort of uh, uh, liberal regime in relation to opium, uh, to opioids and so on. And, uh, you know, uh, quite recently, the, uh, I, I think it was like 10 uh, major Dutch police uh, leaders uh, described uh, Holland as a narco state, uh, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, the war on drugs failed catastrophically. The only time that humans uh, really prevailed against opium was the anti-opium movement of the 1880s. You know, and this is also something I write about at some length in my book. Uh, across, uh, across the world, many kinds of voluntary groups, popular, uh, popular groups came together. And these were not uh, uh, to oppose opium, you know, to oppose the free opium trade that had been imposed by colonial powers. And I think there's a very clear parallel, uh, really, with the climate movements. Uh, you know, climate movements, I think, can take uh, some heart from the successes of the anti-opium movement, because the anti-opium movements were fighting then uh, the world's most important, uh, most powerful entities, which were the European empires, uh, who, who put up a very determined and skillful resistance, uh, you know, uh, to curtailing opium. But eventually, uh, these groups prevailed. And I think we really can, I mean, the climate movement can take some heart from that. But it's very important, I think, to distinguish between various kinds of psychoactive substances. One last question. Yeah. Shifting from opium to Bombay, actually. <clears throat> uh, you said correctly, of course, that many communities were involved with opium trade. We know the Gujaratis, Kachis, the Valyas, in fact, still are opium dealers. <clears throat> but it's true also that the Parsis uh, gained more, not just economically, but also in cultural privilege. What is curious is if you look at writings in the 1820s, 1830s, by the British about the Parsis. It's really, they are quite hostile to them, in fact. You know, because the Parsis uh, were brothel keepers and uh, bootleggers at that time. And they were also responsible for a lot of riots in central Bombay. So the shift in the perception of Parsis, something which happened with opium, uh, at least I don't understand how that shift really happened. But uh, by the 1860s, they not only had economic power, but they also had a lot of cultural privilege. So maybe you know a lot more about this. Sure, <laughs> I can talk about that. Um, look, I mean, the Parsis, uh, they developed their connections with the Dutch uh, as early as the 16th century, you know. And this was one of the reasons why they were able to travel to Guangzhou and so on, because uh, they found place in the Dutch factory. So, uh, you know, there are these several sort of, I can't think of a better term, any better term to use, except white adjacent. You know, there were these several white adjacent groups that were very involved uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, you know, work, working in tandem uh, with the colonial powers. Armenians were one of them. Uh, the, uh, the uh, Parsis were amongst them, but also, you know, various uh, Chinese groups, uh, you know, the Nonya Chinese in, uh, uh, in Southeast Asia similarly established that kind of relationship. Uh, Baghdadi Jews also, you know. So these groups developed this relationship. So Parsis, the reason, you know, we are always taught that India became anglicized under Western rule. I present an absolutely contrary argument. I think the place of great innovation culturally um, and in every other way uh, was actually Guangzhou. You know, so it's these, it's these uh, traders who go to Guangzhou uh, who learn what is happening in the world. 
you know they learn about foreign exchange they learn how to trade and this is true not only of parsis but also of the uh, of the americans uh, it's extraordinary the degree to which you know american traders uh, get involved uh, in opium but also they become the great innovators so for example the american rail networks uh, of the early 19th century all built by opium traders you know who go back from uh, so they develop similar aspirations you know american traders also want to make hotels you know like the parsis did and you see this kind of, so what it what it does is that it gives them exposure uh, to uh, international trade and that becomes their great advantage so uh, in indian industry parsis absolutely were the pioneers in every field not just of industry but also in cricket uh, in theater in all all those fields i have a a brief story about cricket which links your question to um, Amitabh's response and indeed to his book. One of the Parsi traders you mentioned is Sir Jamshedji Jiji Boy, you'll figure several times. And um, he, when the British built their first big gymkhana, Bombay gymkhana and their Apollo field, uh, they needed money for uh, the pavilion. And Jamshedji Jiji Boy, partly to acquire cultural capital, gave them 75,000 rupees. But of course, he could not enter the pavilion. <laughs> but he was happy to do that for, for um, you know, for whatever political and cultural benefits he could get. So on that note, thank you very much for being here. Amitabh is going to sign books outside. Uh, so please pick up this book of his and, and check it. And thank you, Ram. And uh, next time, we will get him, not this year, but a few years down the road, for our wonderful Bangalore Literature Festival. Sorry.